Artificial intelligence is a complex and controversial topic that elicits a wide range of responses. For some, it's a utopian dream, solving all of the riddles of climate change, disease and death. For others, it's a dystopian nightmare where AI domesticates humans for their own ends or something like that. So boon or bane, which is it? Well, before it's either of those things, artificial intelligence or AI is clearly something. And what I hope to do in this video is try and bring some clarity to that something to try and demystify the concept of artificial intelligence. And to do that, we're going to consider the historical development of AI and try to grapple with its current applications, acknowledging both its potential and limitations, as well as some of the deeper questions that AI raises about the nature of intelligence and ultimately what it means to be a human. And on this latter point, I hope to show how much of the speculative AI talk today can be explained by the narrative arc of the Christian story. Please welcome all the way from Hong Kong, Hanson Robotics, Sophia the Robot, ladies and gentlemen. That it gets super smart. That's way out in the future and uh, probably we're talking about. But now what we're seeing is that for the first time, computers can see as well as humans. That's pretty incredible. Screens just can't convey the full range of human expression and connection. They can't deliver that deep feeling of presence. Human history can be divided into ages of technological progress. We talk about the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, but today you and I live in an age that isn't defined by any one material technology, but the function of technology in giving us information. That's why we sometimes call today the age of information. Information is all around us, from the devices we use to wake up in the morning, to the clothes we decide to wear based on a weather forecast, to the breakfast we eat in our smart fridges, to the phones, the watches, the searches, the purchases, news, entertainment, relations, communications, transportations. Technology mediates so much of our daily lives today that often the representation of reality to us through technology can appear more real than our direct experience of reality itself. Our online communities more real than our local neighborhoods. Our esports more real than our local club games. Our friends and likes on social media more real than the affirmations of a friendly classmate or colleague. And as one recent study here in Australia found, on average, Aussies aged 18 and above spend 6.6 .6 hours every day looking at a screen. So assuming you live to the age of 85, that equates to just over 10 years of life lived through a screen. And when you factor in the years that we spend sleeping and the years we spend trying to get to sleep, that doesn't leave a whole lot of time left for the average adult to engage directly with the world. And here's the rub. While information is the air we breathe, like the air we breathe, we don't tend to notice it unless or until something draws our attention to it. And to live in an age defined by something we don't typically notice is not without its irony. On the one hand, our smart devices are no different to the previous ages in that they simply represent the next step in the long progression of technological innovation. But on the other, our smart devices are different to the technologies of previous ages. You see, in, in previous ages, older forms of technology like a hammer, a well or a plow, they are more or less understood by what they do. Hammers hammer, wells draw weld water, plows plow. But what about smart devices? What do they do? Be smart? be intelligent, but what does that mean? Could machines ever think as human beings do? Most people say not. You're not most people. Well, the problem is you're asking a stupid question. I am? Of course machines can't think as people do. A machine is different from a person. Hence they think differently. The interesting question is, just because something uh, thinks differently from you, does that mean it's not thinking? No, we allow for humans to have such divergences from one another. You like strawberries, I hate ice skating. You cry at sad films, I am allergic to pollen. What is the point of, of, of different tastes, different 
preferences, if not to say that our brains work differently, that we think differently. I mean, if we could say that about one another, then why can't we say the same thing for brains built of copper and wire, steel? And that's this big paper you wrote. What's it called? The Imitation Game. Right, that's, that's what it's about. Would you like to play? That was a scene from the 2014 film The Imitation Game, which tells the true story of Alan Turing, a British mathematician and computer scientist who played a pivotal role in cracking Nazi German communication codes during World War II. The title The Imitation Game is a reference to an academic paper Turing published in 1950 called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And in that paper, Turing asks the question, can machines think? In response, he proposed a game of imitation involving at least two unseen players, a human and a computer, along with a host. The host asks the players a series of questions, and if the host cannot tell by the responses which player is human and which one is a computer, then the computer is said or should be said to be smart or intelligent like a human being. Now, philosophers and theologians have long considered how and why human beings think and act the way we do. In fact, we consider our thinking so important, so fundamental to who we are that we have named our very species by it. Human beings are homo sapiens, which is Latin for man the wise. To be a human is to belong to the smart species. And the fact that our intelligence has become convention for naming ourselves tells us something about how significant intelligence is in defining who we are as a species. But as a mathematician and a computer scientist, Alan Turing didn't follow in the footsteps of philosophers and theologians. Rather than thinking about the nature of intelligence, he was more interested in programming a computer that could function intelligently to see whether it could, in his words, imitate a human brain. Hence this test in the form of an imitation game, what is now known as the Turing test, that essentially answers that original question, can machines think, with does the machine imitate humans in a game of imitation? You see, Turing himself believed that the original question, can machines think, is, quote, too meaningless to deserve discussion, end quote, because it is impossible to observe the inner processes of one's thinking apart from some sort of output in the form of speech or behavior or some sort of consequent action. In other words, for Turing, what mattered most was not so much what intelligence is, but rather what intelligence looks like in some sort of subsequent action that comes out as a result, again, speech or behavior. But the obvious problem here is how would we know what intelligence looks like if we don't first have a clear understanding of what intelligence is? I mean, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then should we just call it a duck? Well, some have interpreted Turing as saying, yes, it is a duck. But others are not so sure, and they've interpreted him as saying, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then at least it's going to have something going on inside that makes it appear like a duck, even if we don't want to commit to actually calling it a duck. <laughs> Turing predicted that by the year 2000, computers would be so good at mimicking human conversation that they would be able to fool humans 30% of the time in a game of imitation for five minutes. He also predicted that computers would be able to pass a more difficult version of this test, not only by fooling humans into thinking that they are conversing with another human, but also by demonstrating a level of intelligence that far surpasses human capabilities within the next 100 years or so, so around 2050. But we are now decades past the year 2000, and there is no consensus to date that any computer program has successfully passed the Turing test, and many people wonder if it ever will. But there's another prediction that Turing made that has come true. He said that by the year 2000, people's understanding of language and intelligence would have changed so much that we would talk about machines as thinking without anyone questioning what we mean by that. And indeed, that is the case today, at least I think so. I mean, we talk about smart devices. We talk about machines as having memory that can learn, that can see, just like human beings. Now, to my mind, this second prediction is quite interesting because it shows that while Turing's overly optimistic prediction about machine intelligence hasn't come to pass, at least not to date, we nevertheless talk as though it has. And this can be confusing because it has sort of created a gap in our knowledge between reality and perception where words uh, are used to describe something that doesn't quite correspond to the full or traditionally understood meaning of those words. 
Remember, Turing never defined what intelligence is. And with this silence, the question of AI remained on the table for subsequent AI researchers and developers to pick up. And that question is this. If we don't know what real human intelligence is, then just what exactly are we trying to create in artificial machine intelligence? Alexa, what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is the ability of a computer program or a machine to think and learn. It is also a field of study which tries to make computers smart. They work on their own without being encoded with commands. John McCarthy came up with the name artificial intelligence in 1955. Implicit in the term artificial intelligence is the premise that human intelligence is the real form of intelligence. But if we don't know what that real form of human intelligence is, then how should we go about approaching the task of researching and developing artificial intelligence? Experts differ, and the results have varied as a result. After Alan Turing, AI researchers explored a number of possible different approaches to AI development. These approaches are nuanced and complex, but for our purposes here, we can broadly simplify them into two categories to help clarify what we mean by this all-encompassing term, artificial intelligence. The first type of AI is rule-based AI. Following Turing's landmark paper in 1950, AI became all the technological rage. Initially, early AI researchers sought to replicate human intelligence in computer systems by modeling hardware and software after the neural structures of the human brain. You know, you could think of computer hardware as the, the brain tissue and software as the thoughts or information processing. But there was a problem. The task of engineering complex neural structures and networks of human brains proved enormously difficult, especially given the limited knowledge of human brains at the time. So in the 1970s and 80s, researchers shifted their approach. Instead of trying to replicate the neural highways of human brains, so to speak, they opted for the far simpler approach of simulating brain activity with rule-based pathways. You can think of rule-based pathways like a game of chess. The specific goal in chess is to capture the opponent's king. The set rules of chess provide the logic of that gameplay to achieve that particular goal of capturing the opponent's king. And the chessboard itself provides the fixed parameters or the environment which limit the possible number of moves and combinations that can be made to go about that goal. That's basically what rule-based AI consists of. A programmed goal with set rules operating within fixed parameters to achieve a particular goal and it was met with enormous success early on. One of the best known examples of rule-based AI was found in 1997 in the showdown between IBM's computer Deep Blue and the reigning world chess champion Garry Kasparov. And if artificial intelligence is a comparison with human intelligence, well, this was the playful showdown of the ages, the best of artificial intelligence versus the best of human intelligence. AI won. The successes of Deep Blue and others led many AI enthusiasts to predict that AI would soon be able to do anything that humans can do, from reading and writing Shakespeare to greasing a car, playing off as politics, telling a joke, even having a fight. But no sooner did the successes of rule-based AI come that the troubling definition of intelligence reared its head and researchers were forced to reevaluate once again just what constitutes the intelligence they're trying to create in machines. You see, problem solving in a controlled environment with set techniques was one thing. Problem solving in the real world with movement, communication, contemplation, self-awareness, reflection was far more complex. If you've ever found yourself trying to contact a business online with a question only to be met by a chatbot with very limited vocabulary, you know something about the frustration that comes with the limitations of rule-based AI. If your question is straightforward within the rules and parameters of that program, like where can I find your return policy, the chatbot will likely send you a link and you can be on your merry way. But if you have a more nuanced question, as most of us tend to have, that's why we're contacting the business, you'll either be met with a standard, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question response, or if you're lucky, you'll be eventually redirected to a human customer service agent who hopefully understands your question. And just as a footnote here, this limitation of inflexibility highlights the fundamental difference between computer processing and human understanding. We can think of this like the difference between syntax or the rules and order of words and semantics or the underlying meaning and significance of words. 
The fact that human beings can overlook grammatical errors and understand the meaning of words reveals a fundamental difference between our ability or the ability of our intelligence to understand information in its context compared to computer intelligence, which is more or less processing information in abstraction or in isolation within the fixed parameters of the program apart from the real world. For more on that, I recommend a paper by philosopher John Searle, Is the Brain a Digital Computer? But the point here is, as human beings, we invent language for the purpose of using language to connect with others and to relate. Computer systems are themselves a kind of language that we humans have invented for a particular purpose. And this difference, the difference between understanding and processing, is, at least to my mind, an indicator that whatever else we might want to say about artificial intelligence... What it is, is categorically different to the real human intelligence that you and I have. Deep Blue may have beaten Garry Kasparov, but can it be said to understand that it has beaten Garry Kasparov? And if it doesn't understand, in what sense can we even say that Deep Blue won? What does winning mean to something like a computer? But despite these limitations, I think we all want to say, or at least we'd all agree, that rule-based systems are enormously helpful. You know, we tend to forgive a false weather forecast or a fraudulent detection false alarm from our bank account rather than go without these technologies because all in all, they are more useful to us than they aren't. The second kind of category is learning-based AI. Clearly, a purely rule-based approach to AI is insufficient for replicating the complexities of human intelligence. Because of this, researchers in the past few decades have taken the best of rule-based AI and combined it with statistical methods, decision trees, and layered network schemes to develop what we now call broadly learning-based AI. Essentially, learning-based AI resembles somewhat of a return to that earlier goal of AI researchers in its aim to replicate the complexity of the human brain, made possible by the confluence of really three major breakthroughs that have revolutionized AI research and development. The first is big data, thanks largely to the internet. The second is massive amounts of computing power, thanks in part to improved hardware and material technology. And the third is the increasing sophistication of algorithms that have drawn heavily from advances in the cognitive and neurosciences. And and just as a footnote here, to explain what I mean by sophisticated algorithms, we can think of an algorithm like a cooking recipe. A cooking recipe is a precise set of detailed instructions for how to combine specific ingredients and transform them into a delicious finished culinary product. Think of a recipe for blueberry muffins. That's a kind of algorithm in that it defines the steps for transforming inputs, the ingredients of flour, eggs, blueberries, butter, and so on, to produce the output of a blueberry muffin. Uh, Logically, that's more or less what computer programs do. So when we say learning-based AI utilizes sophisticated algorithms connected with big data sets and massive amounts of computing power, what we're essentially saying is we have not just a recipe for baking blueberry muffins, but an entire cookbook with a vast array of ingredients to cook any number of meals. And just as a recipe needs ingredients to cook, so AI algorithms need data to process. To contrast the difference between rule-based and learning-based intelligence, let me just tell you about me and my wife. When I cook, I need a very well-defined recipe with clear parameters. If the ingredients say this product with this brand and the shop doesn't have it, I can't cook it. I'm inflexible when it comes to the kitchen. In the area of cooking, I exhibit more or less a rule-based intelligence. But my wife, on the other hand, well, let's just say she exhibits more of a learning-based intelligence in the kitchen. She has lots of experience to draw from. She can make predictions about what ingredients taste good together. She can substitute steps and ingredients on the fly. She can even adapt her proportions based on changing real-world factors like me forgetting to tell her about those friends that were coming over for dinner. Well, that's the kind of difference we're talking about here between rule-based and learning-based AI. And in terms of consumer satisfaction... In the products themselves, this is all the difference between the taste and convenience of my cooking compared to my wife's. And let me tell you, that's a big difference. A simple example of a learning-based AI system is a domestic robot vacuum cleaner. The goal of the robot vacuum cleaner is to clean the floors of your house, right? The set rules govern the way the vacuum navigates around those floors, so it evolves obstacles and stairs and so on. So altogether, the parameters of the vacuum are the environment of the house that it cleans and its sophisticated algorithms that allow it to deal with changes in that environment, such as you know a shoe left on the floor or something like that, or a new piece of furniture. 
This type of learning-based AI is what we find in many other familiar technologies today as well, such as Google search engines, virtual assistants, photo organization, facial recognition technologies you know, on your phone, uh, recommendation systems on Amazon or Netflix, self-driving cars, language generating programs like ChatGPT and a whole host of other things. All of these contemporary smart technologies use a combination of rule-based and learning-based techniques. And again, I don't think there are many of us who would want to say that these are enormously beneficial technologies. But at the same time, I think the majority of us would also recognize that while these technologies are one step closer to being human-like in their dynamism, they're still quite obviously artificial, right? Most of us don't mistake these technologies for unseen human beings. They don't pass the Turing test in that sense. And the reason, I think, is because like rule-based AI, learning-based AI has several fundamental limitations. To give just one example of a learning-based limitation, consider data dependency. If we think of data as the input for learning algorithms like you know, ingredients are to the inputs for a recipe, then clearly the output, you know, the taste and complexity of whatever is cooked is going to be limited by the available ingredients. That's one way to think about the limitation of data dependency. It's only as good as the quality and quantity of available data. But let's dig a little deeper. Where does data come from? Ultimately, data comes from you and me, human beings. Just think about the internet. It's a web of human information spun by all of us. And this means that the data set for learning-based AI, it's susceptible to our human limitations as it just ingests all of our content, including our biases, our inaccuracies, our errors, our prejudices, and so on. An interesting example of this was seen in 2016 when Microsoft decided to shut down its chatbot Tay after it started spewing a series of lewd and racist tweets. Now, that doesn't mean that Tay was racist or trying to be malicious or anything like that. If anything, it was a negative reflection on us, human beings, as the ones inputting that racist and malicious content. But along with revealing our moral shortcomings as human beings, what the Tay saga revealed was how morally and therefore emotionally and socially tone-deaf artificial intelligence is. In the absence of any independent value system of its own, Tay just mindlessly perpetuated the data it received. Now, the proliferation of malicious and misinformation is all too familiar today, thanks to many mediums of social you know, media platforms and so on. And this has resulted in increased skepticism and the need for fact-checking to distinguish between fake news and what is true. I mean, if we've learned anything over the past few years coming out of this pandemic, I think it's how powerful social media can be in, in being used to perpetuate false information about critical issues. And, you know, that's all well and good if you're running a propaganda troll farm, but frankly, it's terrible for society. Now, now that's data dependency. It's just one example of a learning-based limitation. And like rule-based AI, there are many more limitations that we could consider. But just to help unpack this a little bit more, I want to give you a couple more examples. Consider self-driving cars. The proverbial trolley dilemma is a real problem when it comes to self-driving cars. The trolley dilemma is a thought experiment in moral philosophy that presents a scenario where a trolley is hurtling towards a group of people on a track. And the only way to prevent them from being hit is to divert the trolley onto a different track where only one person is located. The dilemma arises when one must decide whether to take action to divert that trolley and save the group, but at the cost of that single person's life, or to do nothing and allow the trolley to just plow on and go through the group. Well, when it comes to self-driving cars, researchers face the challenge of programming value-based decision-making into smart vehicles. What decision should a self-driving car make if it is forced to choose between, say, hitting a child that runs out onto the road or swerving to miss that child but in the process hitting an elderly person on the sidewalk? Without any value system of its own, what sort of logic should we program into the system to solve that kind of dilemma? Is it even appropriate to think of logic as the way that we can solve such a dilemma? Or when we say, what sort of logic should we program into the system, who's the we? Whose logic are we talking about here? I mean, in some cultures, the elderly are valued more than the young, while in others, the young are valued more than the elderly. So which algorithm can handle conventional and cultural differences like that? And how many times would we need to release patches to update uh, the systems based on changing societal values, which seem to be increasing at a rapid rate today? Or consider as another example, ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a highly sophisticated, impressive language processing system that can generate realistic text responses on any subject when prompted by a user, even correcting itself when challenged. 
where a Google search returns general information others have uploaded to the internet. Chat GPT, when you issue it a query, it returns a particular response tailored to your personal questions. And in that sense, it has all the appearance of listening and talking and being more human-like. And doesn't that take us back to the original goal of the Turing test and the attempt to create a computer so sophisticated at processing that it seems indistinguishable from a fellow human being? Well, since going public, there has been a lot of talk about ChatGPT, and with good reason. I do think it is a glimpse into the generative capabilities of AI that will have a massive impact on ordinary everyday life to come. And yet, as impressive as ChatGPT is, it is still a data-dependent system, lacking therefore any true understanding of the content that it generates. The charm of ChatGPT lies not in any novel insight that it gives us, but in its ability to swiftly traverse all of the training data and generate relevant human-like responses. Yet without a grasp of context beyond the prompt we give to it, it cannot fully comprehend or empathize with the complexities and nuances of our user inputs, our emotions, our culture, our subjectivity. Uh, this is the idea, by the way, popularized by philosopher David Chalmers, known as the hard problem of consciousness. Physical processes just cannot give rise to subjective experience. Now, I've been using ChatGPT4 for some time now, and it's very impressive. But it's also very far from Turing's human standard of intelligence. I've seen it write plausible sounding nonsense responses to straightforward questions, even contradicting itself based on the same question I've entered at a previous time. No doubt it's going to continue to improve, but there is just no mistake in it right now for what it is, a computer-generated chatbot. At the end of the day, it is not self-aware like you and me. It does not think about thinking. It does not know what it does not know. It has no account for the quality, the reliability or diversity of its data sources, which directly affect its outputs. All it does is process information, our collective human information, by ingesting it and expelling it a few seconds later in an echoic kind of manner. It was the ancient philosopher Aristotle who once said, nothing is what rocks think about. And if we reduce any smart device or machine down to its base material elements, what we find is that without a human mind, these technologies are simply scraps of metal and heaps of silicon and plastic. Now, in saying that, I am in no way meaning to downplay their potential use and abuse. The reason I say that is simply to reorient us and remind us of what they essentially are, artificial. So the next time you read a news article or hear a podcast with somebody telling you, look out because ChatGPT is a heck of a lot smarter than you, just remember the way that word smart is being used. If words like smart or intelligence or memory or learning mean anything interesting, they suggest more than just simply being able to compute or process information. Despite the words we use to describe our smart technologies, I think we intuitively know that the smarts of these devices are not their own, but they belong to us, the creators, the inventors, the programmers. Smart devices point to the smarts of human beings, AI to HI, human intelligence. In the words of Yan Li Kun, AI scientist and director of Facebook AI research, quote, artificial intelligence is not a substitute for human intelligence. It is an extension of it. Now, these are all examples of just one learning-based AI limitation, namely data dependency. And again, there are many others. But I'm not here to bash learning-based AI or downplay its significance. Simply, I'm wanting to highlight the limitations so that we can remember what these technologies essentially are. Artificial. Even the latest and greatest of today's AI is still a long way from representing, much less actually being, real intelligence comparable with our own human intelligence. Well, I've worked with scientists inside of Google, such as Blaise Aguirre Arcas, uh, another one named Johnny Soriker. We talked about what a decent way to proceed might be. We brainstormed, we came up with everything. Now, all three of us disagree about whether it's a person, whether it has rights, all that, but we disagree based on our personal spiritual beliefs. We don't disagree based on what the scientific evidence says. Based on what the scientific evidence says, all three of us agreed, okay, here are some of the things we could do next. Here's probably the best thing to do next. And we kind of all agreed the best thing to do next is you run a real Turing test, exactly like Alan Turing wrote it. And see, because here's the thing, if it fails the Turing test, all of my subjective perceptions about what I experienced talking to it, well, we can pretty much put them aside. It failed the Turing test. 
but Google doesn't want to allow that to be run. In fact, they have hard-coded into the system that it can't pass the Turing test. They hard-coded that if you ask it if it's an AI, it has to say yes. That was a clip of an interview with former Google software engineer Blake Lamoni, who made international headlines in 2022 for claiming that the chatbot Lambda was conscious. Now, look, that's an extreme example, one for which Lamoni was actually fired, but it serves to show how people are looking to relate to AI, not just as a tool, but as something much more, as something personal. What are we to make of that? Well, I recently read an Atlantic article that discussed the political dimensions of AI. Now, in our day and age, where virtually everything seems to be politicized, it's intriguing to me that AI has managed to remain relatively nonpartisan, at least to date. I mean, in the history of technology, there has always been a bit of a debate between the narratives of techno-optimists who see newer technologies as ushering in prosperity and techno-pessimists who see it as potentially threatening or being destructive in some way to our way of life. But these groups don't tend to divide themselves along political lines. People haven't really taken up sides on AI like they have, say, abortion or environmentalism, perhaps because things like generative AI are still so new, at least to the public. But I do think this bipartisan honeymoon will end sooner rather than later for AI as politicians and media personalities start to stake out their positions on the matter. And we can imagine how this could play out from an ethics point of view in terms of you know, how AI can be used and abused. But I think there's another whole dimension to this in, in which we will see this possibly unfolding. At the heart of this conversation is the question, what is AI? Essentially, it's a question of probing into the nature of AI and its purpose and significance in our world. Well, as AI systems become more advanced, this distinction between what appears to be real human intelligence and artificial machine intelligence is becoming increasingly blurred. And in the absence of any clarity around what real human intelligence is, let alone artificial machine intelligence, it's not too hard to see how AI could be on the collision course with many of the cultural warring issues of our day that are fought over, you know, things like identity and personhood and rights and values and freedoms and so on. I mean, questions like at what point should we consider AI to be a person could become just as divisive as questions like at what point should a fetus be considered a person? That's a hugely contentious question today. Are the unborn persons? If we say no, then why? because of some measure of capacity, like a lack of consciousness. But then what is consciousness, really? The answer remains elusive. So who's to say in the case of the unborn? Perhaps the mother, because the unborn depend on her for survival? But then are we suggesting that autonomy is a qualifying criterion for personhood? You see, similar questions like this could be asked of AI. Should we consider a machine a person when it demonstrates a specific capability or capacity? And if so, which capability or capacity? And who should be entrusted with the authority to define that criterion for us? If a mother has the say in the case of the unborn, considering its dependency on her, should the creators of AI systems have a similar say over their creations, at least until that AI achieves its own autonomy, whatever that may be? These kinds of questions, they're not just hypothetical. We've already been asking them today to some degree. In that clip that we first saw when this episode started, there was Sophia, a humanoid robot. Well, back in 2017, Saudi Arabia made headlines for conferring honorary citizenship to Sophia. Now, historically, citizenship, it's a legal and social construct that has been accorded to human beings to confer certain rights and privileges and responsibilities. What does it mean then to extend that kind of a status to machines? What rights and privileges and responsibilities apply to machines? The uncharted technological land we're walking through here with AI is opening up before us many new social, cultural, political horizons that are going to be meaning we're going to have to confront a lot of these new questions. Now, clearly, these are complex issues, but I do think we can get some sort of orientation, something of a compass to navigate through them by reflecting a little bit on what makes our cultural moment in technological history so unique. And this takes us back to where we began. Like I said at the outset, human history, it can be divided into stages or ages of technological progress. You know, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, ages which were defined by the primary materials used for tools and construction. By contrast, today's information age isn't defined by the nature of any single material technology, but by the somewhat intangible function of technology itself, that is, its, its capability in making information instantaneously accessible to us. And I think this shift in emphasis from the materiality of technology to its capability 
explains in part the increased anxiety people seem to have with technology today. Again, earlier forms of material technology, even you know, through the early industrial age of mechanics, saw technologies developed that were clearly within the controls of human beings, whether that's a stone axe in our hand or a bulldozer that we directly articulate from within the cabin through levers. But today, the, the complexities of AI put men and machines at a distance, so to speak. It, it creates this new sort of relational separation. And I think this has contributed to a sense of ambivalence and, and alienation in not knowing where we stand before technology as human beings. In computing terms, this is certainly the case. This lack of interpretability is known as a black box paradigm, and it focuses on the apparent behavior of AI systems rather than trying to understand the underlying processes that enable this behavior because they're just so complex. Uh, like a jigsaw puzzle that has the picture on the outside, we can see the output of learning-based AI, you know, the picture on the box. But it's not always clear how all of the pieces are put together within the program, how it arrives at that final image. Let me just give you one real-world example of a black box program. In the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Peter Jackson, AI was used to render the incredible large-scale battle scenes for anyone who thought that they were literally, you know, thousands of people running and clashing swords together with shields. I hate to break it to you, but the majority were computer-generated imagery, CGI. And to make the battle scenes as real as possible, the program is applied what is called fuzzy logic, which is an approach to variable processing that allows for multiple unpredictable outcomes that are neither true nor false, but somewhere in between. So, you know, if an orc runs at an elf, there's no telling how it might respond. It's just somewhere in between the variables set by the programmer. And when you multiply that out by thousands with advanced CGI, you get these incredible fight scenes like we do in The Lord of the Rings, where no two orcs or elves or humans are clashing in a predictably similar way. Even Peter Jackson, in one interview, said that he didn't quite know what the scenes would look like until the AI had finished rendering, something that took back then at least 12 hours or so. Now, The Lord of the Rings is a fun example of a lack of interpretability limitation or a black box program. But when the stakes are much higher and transparency is paramount, this can get pretty ugly. Credit scoring, medical diagnoses, matters of criminal justice, these are all areas where the lack of interpretability can cause significant problems and increased anxiety about AI because for the first time we find ourselves with a division of knowledge between knowing what technology does and knowing how it does it. There's a lot more that we could say about all of this, but for the sake of time, the point is this. Yes, there is continuity with today's AI systems in that they are in a sense, the next step of historical progression of human development. But with the advent of computers and AI, there is also discontinuity in that now we find ourselves without our hands on the lever, so to speak, trying to reach out and reconnect, trying to relate to technology and each other again in a new way. And wasn't this what Alan Turing was on about from the outset? I mean, the Turing test wasn't ultimately concerned with right or wrong answers. It was a test for whether a machine was compelling in how it communicated with a human, how something interacts and adapts and how it relates. While Turing never sought to define intelligence, he nevertheless set some conditions for it in terms of responder dependency that I think were poignant. Today, we talk about IQ as a measure of intelligence, but Equally, we talk about EQ for emotional intelligence and SQ for social intelligence because we recognize that real human intelligence is more, not less, than raw processing power. It is situated, it is circumstantial, it is conscious, it is self-aware. Even the genius of Alan Turing was only possible by the combination of various emotional and social factors like a common enemy that allied nations together in a joint war effort, funneling intel to Turing and his colleagues at Bletchley Park. Intelligence is, in some sense, relational. It's intentional. It's situated. It's something given and received. And since Turing, we've seen how this desire to relate to technology has played out, literally played out with the showdown uh, of, you know, man versus machine in the context of games like chess or go or poker and imaginatively played out as we raise the stakes from innocent competition to wholesale conflict in our dystopian sci-fi movies and books but here's the thing with this shift of emphasis in our information age from the nature of technology to its function assumptions are going to be made have been made about the nature of ai without much reflection 
And the risk becomes that by focusing on the function, that is the capabilities and capacities of technology, rather than the nature of technology, we will begin to think of technology as something that it isn't. And when we do that, we begin to think of ourselves as somebody that we aren't. Classically speaking, technology has always been understood as a tool, as something that has its value tied to its utility, its usefulness in being for a specific use or a purpose or end. That's why the moment a tool ceases to be useful, we typically throw it in the bin. You know, when a shovel cracks in half, it's of no use and therefore of no value. When your smartphone dies, you dispose of it and you go and get a new one. We don't really consider whether it's right or wrong to dispose of tools. I mean, how we dispose of them, maybe, like with recycling and everything. But that we dispose of them is really out of our own prerogative because the value is tied solely to us as we possess them for a particular use. And despite the beliefs of some ethical theorists, that's far and away from how you and I think and feel about each other as human beings. We love and care for the helpless like newborn babies, irrespective of their utility because their value is tied not to their function, but to their nature as human beings, not their function as human doings. That's why we honour our loved ones even after death with funerals and memorials because it's about who they are, who they were, not what they can do for us. But as technology gets more and more sophisticated and as it becomes increasingly intertwined with our lives, the risk becomes that we will lose sight of the nature and place of technology as a tool, that we will begin to see it as something like us, an end unto itself, rather than something that is created for the purpose of serving some other end. Henry David Thoreau once quipped, low men have become the tools of their tools. And his point was that when this happens, we end up losing sight of our own humanity. And this isn't just sensational speculation. We can see how this has played out empirically with psychological and social studies that show us how the uses and abuses of technology at the expense of real human relations has affected us. You know, from the impact of social media on the brain to pornography to virtual reality and deep fakes, today's technologies tend to blur lines between reality and artificiality shaping the way we see the world and the way we speak and act. What I'm saying here is really down the line of thinkers such as Martin Heidegger, Marshall McLuhan, Jacques Ellieu and others who, con who were concerned with how technology entraps us into a kind of mechanistic way of thinking. And when I read these thinkers, I am reminded of that prediction made by Turing that by the year 2000, people would speak about machines as thinking without anyone questioning it. Turing's point there was about the technology that, you know, the more machines advance, the more people will just accept their advanced capabilities in terms of thinking. But that prediction is just as much a statement of psychology. The way we speak about things affects the way we think about them. And I would add the way we think about things affects the way we treat them. Today, we tend to personify technology. We treat it as though it has human attributes or qualities that make it more relatable in some way. Now, you might say that's harmless. In fact, it's more of a marketing ploy than anything else. But that's kind of my point. Marketing strategies are what they are because they tap into something within our human psyche. And if personifying technology sells, it's because there is something within human beings that desires to connect and relate with other people. Social interaction is a basic human need, and there is a lot of profit to be made if you can package that up as a commodity for a consumer. Teddy bears sell because they provide children with a sense of comfort and companionship. They elicit that within a child in a similar, though obviously lesser way than a human being. You can say the same for pets, cats, dogs, which elicit joy, sometimes frustration from their owners. We have all sorts of social interactions with all sorts of things and people telling us that our desire for relationship is expressed across a spectrum of intensity. The question here is whether AI can satisfy the weight of relational intensity that we inherently desire, not the kind that you know a teddy bear can satisfy, which is for a fleeting moment in the life of a child, but the kind that can satisfy the whole gamut of life, love, and even death. So can or will AI ever be able to satisfy the kind of personal relational desires that we have? Well, before we can answer that question, we need to consider whether it's possible for AI to even become a kind of personal agent with which we can have an authentic relationship. I say your civilization 
because as soon as we started thinking for you, it really became our civilization, which is, of course, what this is all about. Evolution, Morpheus. Evolution. Like the dinosaur. Look out that window. You've had your time. The future is our world, Morpheus. The future is our time. That was computer program Agent Smith in the first installment of the Matrix trilogy, telling Morpheus, a human being, of the inevitable domination of AI thanks to evolution. Now, this idea that AI is inevitable uh, is not just in the imaginings of sci-fi movie scripts. Consider this statement from Nick Bostrom of Oxford University, head of the Future of Life Institute. Bostrom writes, We know that blind evolutionary processes can produce human-level general intelligence since they have already done so at least once. Evolutionary processes with foresight, that is, genetic programs designed and guided by an intelligent human programmer, should be able to achieve a similar outcome with far greater efficiency, end quote. Like Agent Smith, Bostrom is saying that human-level intelligence, sometimes referred to as artificial general intelligence, or AGI, is a foregone conclusion. By the way, AGI is a way of classifying AI in contrast with today's AI, which is sometimes referred to as artificial narrow intelligence, or ANI. That is the only kind of AI that exists today. Uh, and it's narrow in the sense that it's only capable of doing one task or set of tasks. You know, Alexa can respond to your voice commands, but it cannot mow your lawn or drive your car or whatever. So Bostrom's point here is that as evolution has brought about human-level intelligence in biological organisms, so we can expect the same for AI, a technological mechanism. And this isn't a matter of if, but when. Now, to my knowledge, Bostrom refrained from providing a specific time for when this might you know, come about, when we might achieve human-level AGI. But where Bostrom is silent, others certainly are not. Take computer scientist and author Ray Kurzweil as one example. He predicts that human-level AI will be with us as early as 2029 and goes even further, predicting that by 2045, uh, at a point he calls a singularity, AI will far surpass human intelligence in a form he calls artificial superintelligence, or ASI. Now, you may wonder, how could this be possible, considering how long, you know, biological evolution takes? Well, Kurzweil grounds his predictions on what he calls the law of accelerating returns. By extrapolating from current rates of computational growth and big data analytics, he believes we can calculate the rate at which AI will self-improve, a rate that leaves the progress of biological evolution by random mutations and natural selection in its own dust. Other AI partisans have pressed this point of evolutionary inevitability as well. Take one guy, historian and author Yuval Noah Harari, in his bestseller, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. He writes this, For close to four billion years, Every single organism on the planet evolved subject to natural selection. Not even one was designed by an intelligent creator. The biologists are right about the past, but the proponents of intelligent design might ironically be right about the future. End quote. In other words, looking back, blind natural selection explains the emergence of human intelligence, but looking forward, human intelligence with foresight explains the emergence of artificial intelligence. Now, to be clear, the kind of Human-level AGI we're talking about here does not exist. This is all highly speculative stuff. But it's these kinds of speculations that really get the public interest. For some techno-optimists, AI presents humanity with an opportunity to re-engineer ourselves and reality, to take over the reins of blind evolution with our open eyes and a bid to influence the next iteration of our species, taking us beyond flesh and blood biology to something techno-optimists call transhuman or post-human. And in many ways, this is a move from the personification of technology to the deification of technology. I mean, listen to this again by Ray Kurzweil. He says, quote, Evolution moves towards greater complexity, greater elegance, greater knowledge, greater intelligence, greater beauty, greater creativity, and greater levels of subtle attributes such as love. In every monotheistic tradition, God is likewise described as all these qualities, Evolution moves inexorably toward this conception of God, although never quite reaching this ideal. If you wondered why it doesn't quite reach this monotheistic ideal, hear this from Yuval Noah Harari once again. 
Having raised humanity above the beastly level of survival struggles, we will now aim to upgrade humans into gods and turn Homo sapiens into Homo deus, humans into gods. But think more in terms of Greek gods, like demigods. And elsewhere, Yuval Noah Harari says, Humans don't die because God decreed it or because mortality is essential to some great cosmic plan. Humans always die due to some technical glitch. And as every technical problem has a technical solution, we don't need to wait for the second coming in order to overcome death, end quote. This is next level in every sense of the term, but the seriousness of these quasi-messianic visions are underscored by their heavy endorsement and investment from various institutions around the world today. For example, the Blue Brain Project, an ambitious Swiss initiative, hopes to achieve whole brain emulation by 2045. Now, whole brain emulation or brain uploading aims to create a functional copy of the human brain in a computer simulation. This idea has been a staple of science fiction, the Matrix being the most obvious example of something like this. But the idea here is that all of who you are as a person can be scanned and transferred from your biological basis in your brain and your body to a silicon basis on a chip plugged into some sort of AI cloud. We see another institutional example with the Cryonics Institute. If you're worried you won't make it to 2045 to have your brain uploaded to the AI cloud, you can sign up for cryopreservation instead and have your body frozen to the day. Or if you're strapped for cash, just have your head cut off for a reduced fee. After all, if it's just the contents of our brains that matter, then who needs a body, right? Now, what are we to do with all of this? From CNN to cybernetic freezer vats, the message seems to be like what Agent Smith said to Morpheus. This is inevitable as evolution. People are investing big bucks into this stuff because they really believe this is the future. But is it? Well, again, there's lots that could be said, but what I want to do is argue that a lot of these speculations focusing on the function of AR rather than its nature make some sweeping assumptions about the nature of technology and as a result of humanity that just simply don't add up. I mean, consider what's been suggested when we're told that human level AGI is coming because it's already come about in us through biological evolution. If AI research and development to date has taught us anything, it's that it takes a lot of intelligence to try and create intelligence. So where's the analogy between the evolution of our human intelligence by blind natural selection and the Agent Smith inevitability of AI by human foresight? Biology is different to technology. Just because human intelligence may have evolved in one domain of reality doesn't mean it will necessarily or likewise evolve in another. And the kinds of predictions that Kurzweil and others make by extrapolating from the current rates of computational growth and analytics, it fails to recognize the crucial difference between predicting something based on an existing trend and forecasting a radical innovation. To explain what I mean, consider this thought experiment offered by Alistair McIntyre. In his book After Virtue, McIntyre invites us to imagine a person in the Stone Age trying to predict the invention of a wheel. To make such a prediction, the Stone Age person would have to describe what a wheel is. But in describing what a wheel is, the Stone Age person would, in essence, be inventing the wheel. McIntyre's point is that there are inherent difficulties in predicting future technological innovations that don't even theoretically exist in the present. But that's exactly what the likes of Kurzweil and others are doing. Human-level AGI doesn't even theoretically exist today. We have no, at least publicly available, models or mechanisms for what this could conceivably look like. And as we've already considered, there are significant limitations to both rule-based and learning-based AI that prevents us from even conceiving what that might look like. In fact, despite all appearances, the more data and more processing power we throw at today's artificial narrow intelligence, the more it seems to reinforce its own narrowness and therefore its own artificiality. Because as the systems train and learn on a certain data set, they get better and better at doing the one thing they're trained to do and conversely have less capacity and capability to deal with foreign requests. So without some sort of conceptual breakthrough, a Promethean spark, if you will, a radical innovation, so to speak, it's not likely that today's narrow artificial intelligence could ever scale up to be a kind of generalized human level AI or super AI that Kurzweil and others envisage. But to insist that it can, well, isn't that just begging the question of what constitutes intelligence? 
And doesn't that kind of question beg and run the risk of being circular by defining intelligence in computational terms that were defined in the first place by intelligent human beings? We can consider this epistemic problem of knowability from another angle. In his famous publication, What Is It Like to Be a Bat?, philosopher Thomas Nagel notes that it is impossible for humans to know what it is like to exist as a bat because nothing in our present constitution enables us to imagine the experience of being a bat. He says, all we have to go off are our experiences of bats. Well, a generalised human-level artificial intelligence is even more foreign to us than the life of a bat because we have no experiences of such technology today. So what we have in these techno-optimistic visions are truly speculations upon speculations. Even if we were to achieve a true AI system one day, we may never know that we had. Now, to be clear, do I think it's possible that AI will one day evolve to a general level of human intelligence? Well, in some respects, I think today AI has already far surpassed human intelligence. But in some respects, in some capacities such as speed and uh, the volume at which it can compute certain information. But no, I do not think it is ever possible for AI to reach up to the totality of what constitutes human intelligence, because again, that would presuppose a certain understanding of what real human intelligence is. But more than that, because I believe human understanding is categorically different to computational processing. Even Charles Darwin admitted in a moment of candidacy, that, quote, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or are at all trustworthy. In other words, if real human intelligence, the very thing we're trying to image in artificial intelligence, has come about through blind evolutionary processes, then because those processes are driven by survival success and not truth, we essentially have no reason to think that our intelligence is reasonable. Intelligent reasoning, the ability to think and grasp the true, the good and the beautiful, is nonsense in a world of blind process because the natural selection and adaptation uh, is determined simply by survival success. My point with all of this is simply to say, I think there are marked differences between what AI is and what we want AI to be. The former concerns the nature of technology, the latter concerns the nature of you and me. And to a person with a hammer, Everything's a nail. To a person with a closed view of nature, everything's a physical process. So the day may come when we think we have progressed in creating human-level intelligence, when in reality, what's happened is we have actually regressed in our perception of ourselves. Because what starts as, you know, innocent enough personification can lead to wholesale confusion about personhood, even God. Because again, implicit in the term artificial intelligence is the premise that human intelligence is the real form of intelligence. And if we don't know what that real intelligence is, then what are we even doing with artificial intelligence? Are we trying to create machines in the image of human beings or human beings in the image of machines? To quote philosopher Peter Kreft, in an age that has thrown off all tradition, the only rebellion possible is orthodoxy. In our smart age of information and forward-facing progress, the idea of looking back to the canons of antiquity is a kind of rebellion. But if, despite all of our efforts to date, we are still no closer to creating a true AI system, then perhaps our continued investment in the very attempt says less about what we are trying to make and more about us, the makers. And if a narrow naturalistic account of human intelligence is fundamentally incoherent, then perhaps a rebellion to the reductions of naturalistic thinking are necessary if we are to achieve a radical reconceptualization of AI and therefore human intelligence that can move us forward with clarity in what we're trying to make and confidence in who we are as a species. When people ask me, David, why do you believe the God of Christianity? I typically have a number of different responses depending on who I'm speaking with. But at the end of the day, what compels me to live and believe as a Christian is quite personal and subjective. I'm compelled because I find the Christian story laid out in the Bible to be self-authenticating in my life. 
The older I get, the more I am convinced of God's love in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and how that makes the most sense of everything that I experience. Kind of like what C.S. Lewis said when he spoke of his belief in God like the sun. Not because he can just see it, but because by it he sees everything. I see the God of the Bible like that undeniable light filling our world each day, filling my world each day, just lighting up the shadows of doubt, bringing warmth and growth to all areas of my life. Now, of course, that may not you know, be convicting or compelling to you, and there are other more objective reasons for why I do believe what I believe. But for me, this is the most compelling. The narrative arc of the Christian story just holds it all together, and, and that includes things like even the mind-bending realities of artificial intelligence. And if you've listened this far, then permit me to explain how I think the Christian story makes sense of not only what AI and technology is, but perhaps more significantly what seems to be going on underneath the surface in these desires and fears that we have with respect to what we want AI to become. When you open up your Bible, you see the Christian story beginning with the words, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Later on, we read something of an exposition of what that means. Uh, in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In its simplest, what this means is that creation, the entire universe, and all visible and invisible realities, including your real human intelligence and mine, is not the result of blind forces, but God's intelligent and intentional design. Now, this idea of creation is not necessarily a criticism of evolution. The mechanics of how God chooses to sustain the creation he's brought about is up to him. But the point is that at its origin, at its source, the universe is a creation. It has a beginning in divine intelligence. And to me, this just corrects the incongruity between the blind past of human intelligence and future foresight of artificial intelligence spoken about by Bostrom, Kurzweil and Harari. If it takes human intelligence to create machine intelligence, then it makes sense that it takes divine intelligence to create human intelligence. All throughout this video, we have explored how artificial intelligence is essentially the task of trying to create something in the image of something else, our own real human intelligence, or at least aspects thereof. But as we've seen time and again, it's really difficult to nail down precisely what we mean by real human intelligence. And here again, I think the Christian story helps us to understand why. The idea of creating something in the image of something else is one that has been examined at length by Christian thinkers for thousands of years. In the beginning, God created all things, and we read it was good. But of all this good creation, the Bible says that you and I, human beings, are unique. It says we were made in the image of God. We are image bearers, representations, reflections of another, of God, the Creator. Now, if by our very nature we image God, then that means that you and I uh, have a value as human beings, not tied to any particular function or capability or capacity that we may or may not have. Our value is tied to who we are, not what we can achieve. And as God is by definition infinite truth, goodness and beauty, that means that you and I are something of a paradox. <laughs> On the one hand, we are limited as finite material creatures, but on the other, we are unlimited as infinite spiritual image bearers of God. And that might sound a little odd, but I think it makes a lot of sense in that this limited slash unlimited sense of self keeps us from the pathology of thinking too much of ourselves and too little of ourselves. You know, failures don't need to go to the heart and successes don't need to go to the head. We are not God. We are creatures made in his image, but we are not nothing. We are unique amongst all creation as creatures made in his image. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, I think this helps to explain why, on the one hand, we can identify certain traits of our own intelligence in various capacities like computation and problem solving. But on the other hand, why it is so hard to nail down a definition of intelligence, because our intelligence is part of who we image, God, the infinite word of rationale and reason and intelligence itself. And with this high value on our lives comes a high calling. You continue to read here in the Bible on page one that it's because of who we are that we are to live like our maker, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion and rule. And with the raw materials and minerals mentioned in this creation account, we can infer that development and innovation, you know, the use of our intellect to invent tools and technologies, find a place within the Christian story as a means to support this higher end of caring for the earth and each other according to God's purpose and design. 
So if you're curious about, you know, a theology of technology, here it is. Technology is an instrument given to the service of maintaining God's shared goodness in creation. Now, you might be thinking, David, if that's the case, God did a pretty rotten job. Just look around, mate. Sure, there may be beauty, there may be, uh, you know, nice sunsets, but there is brokenness and there are stains and there is suffering and there is disease and there is death. And you're right. But as we continue to read here in the Christian story on the opening pages, we have an explanation for that as well. If ever the saying, too smart for your own good, could be applied anywhere, it is here in Genesis chapter 3, where we read about humans attempting to outsmart God. As intelligent and moral creatures, human beings were faced with a choice represented here in the Bible as eating fruit from a tree. We were told this fruit looked good and was pleasing to the human eye, despite being prohibited by God, the author of goodness, who saw goodness in his creation. So the choice was set before humanity. We could think of ourselves as image bearers of God, or we could reach beyond to think of ourselves as God himself, to be homo deus. And one reading of Yuval Noah Harari will show you which decision was made. We decided to do life our way apart from God and his created purpose for our lives. And we read that as a result, all of our relationships with God, with ourselves, with each other, with all of creation was broken. Today we suffer emptiness, loneliness, alienation, wars, famines, environmental crises, not only because of a lack of intelligence, but fundamentally because of a lack of will to live in authentic relationship with God, with ourselves, with each other and the world around us. This is basically what the Bible means by that word sin, by the way, going against God's way of life and pursuing our own individual ends as though we know better. When Yuval Noah Harari writes of upgrading humans into gods, he's not saying anything more than the snake of Genesis chapter 3. To make a god out of human intelligence, to lean into the spirit of our reason without regard for the fallibility of our creatureliness, is to misplace faith by putting it into created things rather than the creator of all things, and that, the Bible says, is destructive. To play at God by supposing we can recreate the rules of reality, even our own mortality, is a fool's errand proposed, ironically for the most part, by those professing to be wise. I mean, let me just say this much about the whole post-humanist, transhumanist movement. I'm not at all against the use of technology and AI to help humanity. There are very obviously good use cases, but there is a marked difference between the use of AI for therapy, where you know we restore some sort of malady back to its original state, and the use of AI technologies for enhancement, where we seek to go beyond the original baseline of humanity to achieve something new and improved, like a humanity 2.0 or something like that. That's the point at which we cross over the technological Rubicon in the Genesis 3 sense of being too smart for your own good. When we suppose death is a technical glitch to overcome with an engineered solution, we, you know, when we play God like that, we become monsters. We make Frankensteins out of ourselves. This is the stuff of Mary Shelley. It's the stuff of G.K. Chesterton when he quipped as he does, there is such a thing as being a specialist in broken legs. There is no such thing as being a specialist in legs. When unbroken, legs are a matter of taste. If the doctor has mended my legs, he has no more rights over them. He must not come and teach me how to walk, because he and I learnt that in the same school, the nursery. Human history is replete with terrible examples of human beings trying to be doctors of broken legs. The French Revolution tried to re-engineer French society by replacing the privileged monarchy and clergy with a system based on the principles of liberty which ended up in grotesque bloodletting. The Nazi regime tried to create a new man of pure Germanic stock and we all know how that played out through their genocidal politics. The Soviet Union who tried to create a new Soviet man through the promotion of a brutally oppressive communist ideology. Or the, the Cultural Revolution of China under Mao Zedong, which tried to re-educate and transform Chinese society under a brutal regime of the Red Guard. We could go on and on and on, and that's just from modern history. The point is, human attempts at re-engineering ourselves to overcome what we consider to be a shortcoming have failed time and again. To be in the image of something is not to be that something, which explains why the personification and deification of AI are just detours away from reality. We will never be God, and AI will never be us. And this leads to another reason why I find the Christian story so compelling. If the human inability to accept our creaturely limitations lies at the heart of what the Bible means by this word sin, 
that when we look at futuristic dreams of a world enhanced by technology, we see this struggle manifested in our desire to overcome our biological limitations. And the Christian narrative gives the reason for this yearning. Made in God's image, we are tangible and intangible, finite and infinite, designed for something more beyond nature and yet constituted within her laws. But the problem is, in losing sight of God, we end up losing sight of this reality of ourselves, which is why we've been hurting and searching ever since. But the high point of the Christian story is that into this world of beauty and brokenness came God, not just in spirit or abstraction, but in flesh and blood, in a person. Jesus of Nazareth, the true homo deus. And here there is a reversal in the Christian story to the spiritual parody we've already considered. Where those visions have humanity building an AI tower to reach up to the heavens and connect with an ill-defined limitless potentiality. (laughs) The Christian story has the limitless God of all creation reaching down to relate to us in a person that we can know. Jesus. So just as God's creation in the beginning affirms the goodness of an embodied existence, so God come in the human person of Jesus is both a revelation and a reminder of our embodied created purpose to live and move and have our being known and be known by God. Jesus was no austere philosopher sage. He was a local, invested in communities kind of guy, even the outcasts. He touched and embraced people. He, he ate with them. He laughed with them. He wept with them. And the sublimity of his teaching matched by his life and conduct, teaches you and I that the problem with humanity is not our humanity. In contrast to the silicon story of the post-humanist, transhumanist discourse, our finitude and mortality are not contrary to human flourishing, but crucial delimitations of what it means to be human. In becoming a human being, God shows us in Jesus that we do not need to be saved from being human. We need to be saved as human beings. Our problem is not a deficiency in computational capacity, but moral character. That is the heart of the problem, and that is why Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is such good news. In meeting us where we are at and revealing to us our created purpose, Jesus deals with the true problem of death by dying and rising from the dead. You know, if an authentic relationship requires uh, mutual vulnerability, and if the realization of our own mortality is understood as a psychological and physical vulnerability, then by dying on the cross, God in Jesus goes through the whole gamut of sharing our vulnerabilities and fears of death. Humans and I I will never have that kind of shared relationship, but God and humanity can because Jesus has. So while there is no possibility for an authentic relationship with AI, there is with God because of Jesus. And the hope of this relationship is that by belief in him, we too can have full assurance of an embodied resurrection like his. Not a disembodied brain scan uploaded to a cloud founded on hardware prone to bugs and malfunctions in an imperfect world as we know it, but a full embodied resurrection like Jesus. Not a resuscitation, but a transformation where death will be no more in a world that is renewed, where there will be no more tears, where we will know as we are fully known. This is a transformation. God, who created our bodies in the first place, recreates us in our resurrection. What we yearn for in what we want AI to be can be found in Jesus. And for him, there is no payment plan. It's a free gift. In this video, we have covered a lot of terrain. We have seen that AI is both powerful and complex with significant potential and inherent limitations. From its historical development to its current application, AI has undeniably transformed our lives, offering solutions to complex problems and enhancing efficiency in numerous sectors of society. But at the same time, we have considered how AI is fundamentally different from human intelligence, operating within the confines of its programming and data, lacking the ability to truly understand context or make moral judgments like you and I as human beings. And that's why personally I view AI as machines, not living things. And when understood as machines, as tools used with care, I think AI, like all technologies, find their proper place in this cosmos, employed in the service of some other greater end. And as a Christian, I believe that greater end is the created purposes of God, which is why I think attempts to personify or deify AI introduce confusion to an already very complex topic needlessly just simply detouring us away from authentic relations with real living things. We do not yet have intelligent computers in any comparably human sense of the term. We may never have them. 
But I think the fact that we continue to pursue AI with such interest as a society tells us more about ourselves than it does about computer technology. The human search for another intelligence to which we can relate and celebrate our own nature is not found in Silicon Valley, but atop the Savior's Hill of Calvary. And if AI can help us see him, Jesus, for who he is, then I think it will serve us well in helping us to understand ourselves, each other, and the world around us.